Hello, Tagori. Welcome again. Hello, Tagori. Can you hear me? Ah. Hello, cool. my friend. Now it's working. How are you? That's pretty good. And you? I'm good too. Now we are live on YouTube. Can, yeah, but can I, I start it formally? Is everything okay for you? Yes, just gonna close this one. Okay. Uh, okay. Ah. okay. Okay, I start now formally. Just, just let me check on YouTube. If it's everything okay. Not yet, just one moment, please. Now, now it's okay. Let's start, let's start it. Hello everyone. My name is Mariana Santiago. I am professor of the postgraduate program in law at the University of Marilia. I hope you all are well and safe in this difficult time that we are living. We will start now our event, uh, weekly event titled Dialogues on Development, Company and Society. It's an event uh, organized by University of Marilia for our students, but now it's completely open to all the law community. Uh, I see that we have some students and professors from, from different places in Brazil. So 
Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure today to have with us Dr. Susan Shaw. She is partner and founder of Living Law, a firm in the United Kingdom. And she is also expert of the United Nations project called Harmony with Nature. Uh, my students already know what it is because I am part of it too. And her lecture will be about uh, the environmental rule of law in, in the Anthropocene, matching the scales of social ecological decision making with planetary boundaries to safeguard the integrity of the Earth system. Uh, the subject is extremely important and, and it's in line with our work at the University of Marilia. We work on this in my classes. Uh, I would like to mention the presence of Professor Dr. Tagori Trajano from Catholic University of Salvador and Federal University of Bahia. And he will discuss the topic with us in a dialogue. Thank you, Professor, for being here with us today. And I have to say thank you to Professor Marielena Diniz and her International Law Institute for supporting this event. Thank you so much. And uh, finally, uh, I wish everyone a great event. Dear Susan, uh, feel free to start a lecture. We, we look forward to hearing you. Thank you so much once again. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you here today. I'm just going to try and share my screen. I have some slides here, which hopefully we'll now share. Can you see that okay? Yes, yes, it's working. Perfect. Um, so I'm really grateful to the organisers of this event, in particular Mariana, um, and hope that we will have some time at the end for questions and experience sharing. Um, as has been mentioned, my talk today is entitled The Environmental Rule of Law in the Anthropocene, Matching the Skills of Social Ecological Decision Making with Planetary Boundaries to Safeguard the Integrity of the Earth System. This is, of course, a hugely wide-ranging subject, and we're aiming to cover a lot of ground today. But I hope that you may take away three key points from my talk. The first of which I'm sure many people here will be aware of already is the immense urgency that the science is now showing that we have to act within collectively. Secondly, that the law does not operate in a vacuum and together with other disciplines, the law must evolve to confront these challenges to maintain international peace and security. And thirdly, that no one here is too small to make a difference the law does not only happen in courtrooms, every one of us exercise democracy in our everyday lives to promote a culture of accountability and to embed a culture of environmental rule of law into decision making. We'll come on to say something shortly about why that does matter. But in my work from advocating for new legislation to enforcing existing rights and applying existing law in new ways, the law comes to life when it is applied. I'm just going to try and move on slides. Oh, there we are. And um, so just for some of you who may not have heard of us before, I've included two general information slides that start about living law and who we are. If you're interested to take a closer look, the slides will be made available after today. We're a public interest law firm established in Scotland in 2012. Our main areas of specialisation are in the spheres of environmental energy and human rights law and policy. And our central founding mission is to uphold the legal rights of access to environmental information, public participation and environmental justice, which are guaranteed by the Aarhus Convention in the UEC region here. And of course, this is now developing also following the entry into force of its sister treaty, the Escazú Agreement in Latin America and the Caribbean region. And of course, the Escazú Agreement has learned from the Aarhus Convention on which it is modelled. And I think it's fair to say that this is perhaps one key area where civil society can and indeed should look to experience share over the coming years based on some of the notable progressions which are included within the text of the Escazú Agreement such as the principle of maximum disclosure, which civil society here may well look to learn from. In short, we advocate for the environmental rule of law 
and a critical legal perspective as key tools to assist humanity in navigating these immensely complex challenges in the Anthropocene towards the shared goal of harmony with nature. It requires us to look across the spectrum of policy, legislative development and enhancement and also litigation when other options fail. Whilst this was once more a lonely area of specialisation, there are now many other organisations springing up all around the world who are like-minded in their mission. And today, as with Mariana, I'm a member of the uh, UN Harmony with Nature initiative, which has been a great source of inspiration um, about how we can unlock this power of possibility. It may not always be the easiest path, but it is incredibly rewarding. And for those of you here today thinking about your next step, the earth certainly needs more good lawyers we'll, um, and you will have the opportunity wherever your career ultimately takes you to apply some of what is being said today in advisory work because of course the environment is a feature of almost every area of law as the foundation of our societies. So without further ado let me turn to the substance of the presentation today. I was incredibly fortunate to prepare my master's thesis some years ago on the interaction between international law in the field of the environment and the concept of planetary boundaries emerging then in the field of science. For those who may not have heard of this concept, it first appeared in the Nature publication in 2009, where world leading scientists had sought to quantify the non-negotiable boundaries in our Earth system, which provide the basis for life on Earth as we know it. And I've included there in the slide uh, a picture of the new Netflix documentary, Breaking Boundaries, The Science of Our Planet, which articulates this in a very compelling way. And unfortunately, we know what the science is telling us. Our planet is in serious trouble, but some of this information is also not new. For the last 30 years, the alarm bell has been ringing. We humanity can still collectively unite to chart a different course to the safe operating space, but time is now critical and the window of opportunity is seriously narrowed. But the science is clear, it's clear as it possibly could be. It's beyond credible dispute. We've transgressed the safe operating space already for several boundaries. We rightly hear much talk of climate, but we must also be clear that this is not only about climate, it is also about biodiversity, our use of chemicals, our oceans, land use, to name just a few. Indeed, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the IPBES, which operates similarly to the IPPC for climate, uh, sorry, IPCC for climate, shows we are now in an ecological crisis with one million species at risk of being wiped out unless we fundamentally change our ways. This, of course, is not only about other species, it is also about people too. So the message from Antonio Guterres, the current UN Secretary General of the United Nations, could not be clearer. Making peace with nature is the defining task of the 21st century, and it must be the top, top priority for everyone everywhere. This is certainly a good time for you to be studying on your course in environmental law. Ahead of the Stockholm Plus 50 conference in 2022, um, as we'll come on to discuss, the international community has a once in a generation opportunity to consolidate, develop and reorientate the environmental rule of law towards that outcome. And I've included there a link to the sustainable development goals, which many of you will also be familiar with, but we're still very far off track to achieve by 2030. Nonetheless, these remain soft law, and I'd suggest that they are a lodestar at both the global and national levels of how we need to collectively navigate these challenges confronting us today. For example, in terms of the importance of gender equality, which is central in goal six, and in terms of energy, the goal seven identifies that it is both affordable and clean energy that we need to be looking towards. So turning to the law, which is our specialism, what then is the role of the law at both global and national levels in these circumstances? One key theme that you will note runs through my talk today is that much of this is actually about applying existing law to these new facts and circumstances we are confronted with. In essence, we need to reconnect law to our higher laws to protect life on air. And in our advocacy, we suggest that rights both human rights and the rights of nature are absolutely fundamental to this. They're not optional nice-to-dos. 
So the starting legal point must be that we all have the right to a safe and healthy environment. While this right may be nascent, it already exists as a matter of human rights law with both substantive and procedural elements that we may come on to discuss. And it's up to us to hold governments to account to safeguard this right in the face of sometimes noisy and sophisticated corporate lobbying. So for sure, law may not always have all the answers to these extremely complex and multifaceted challenges, but it has many and it does set the rules of the game. We must, I suggest, move beyond this notion that governments have a free throw when confronting um, issues of fundamental rights. And for non-lawyers who may join this talk later, it's worth also saying and reminding ourselves why the environmental rule of law matters. Simply put, without the environmental rule of law and the enforcement of legal rights and obligations, environmental governance, conservation and protection may be arbitrary, subjective and unpredictable. And here I would recommend to you to have a read of the IUCN's World Declaration on Environmental Law, which was published not far from you in Rio de Janeiro in 2016, following the first Congress of the World Commission on Environmental Law, which I was extremely pr uh, privileged to participate in within a pre-pandemic circumstance. I want to say something briefly here about international law in the field of the environment. Particularly in the current pandemic, we've been forced to confront the reality of just how interconnected our world is today. The butterfly effect, as it's sometimes known, events on one side of the world can have almost immediate and life-altering consequences in another. We're all global neighbours. There are few far-flung corners of the world today untouched by human impact. It's extremely interesting, I think, in going back to basics, to look again at the concept of sovereignty, which is all too often, unfortunately, and in my opinion, opportunistically, used as a basis to stall or delay the actions which are necessary at a global scale. You will be able to find more um, in the links from our website to the detail of some of this research. But essentially, the current concept or notion of sovereignty, which underpins the rules-based um, order of international law, is frequently referred back to in terms, obviously, of the Westphalian Treaty. But it is a misnotion and a misrepresentation of the concept of sovereignty in law to suggest that it is somehow a right to do harm to others. Sovereignty has never been absolute. There is, of course, no hermetic seal over any sovereign state. And indeed, within the very notion of sovereignty itself, this research suggests there is an intrinsic duty of cooperation. Even in some of the oldest writings, which predate the Westphalian context, the link between external and internal sovereignty was well understood. Public international law and sovereignty implied each other because to be fully in charge of its relations with other states in a society of equal sovereign states and thus to be externally sovereign, a state needed to be submitted to public international law. Thus sovereignty is by its very nature inherently limited. Even if by definition a sovereign state cannot be limited by the laws of another state, it is de facto limited when these laws result from the collective will of all other states. Moreover, sovereignty was never a static concept historically. It has always evolved ultimately as a law of coexistence. Cooperation, therefore, is reflected in today in many multilateral environmental agreements in the environmental field, as well as, of course, we know being a founding principle of the United Nations Charter itself. We might think often here too about the no harm principle or rule um, based on the famous trail smelter arbitration case, which you may have come into contact with as part of your studies. And again, we can see how this can extend to circumstances today of diffuse and aggregate um, harms across multiple scales of decision making. Simply put, there is a, a duty of states to use their best endeavours to cooperate in the face of these challenges. But we are also need to be clear that this does not mean a one size all or eco imperialistic approach. States do still have rights and the opportunities to tailor their responses to their national circumstances, which is well encapsulated by the principle of common but differentiated uh, responsibilities and respective capabilities. We all know that environmental degradations today are increasing at diffuse and aggregate scales which transcend political borders and that this is likely to only intensify despite the increasing profile of discussions and negotiations happening at both the international um, and national levels. 
Um, our close relationship with nature is inescapable and has obviously been brought into sharp focus by COVID. We are nature. Equally, economic well-being remains essential to realising existing human rights and the sustainable development goals. The evidence shows that all these crises, economic, environmental and health, are interconnected and global. To build back better, the UN Special Rapporteur's principles on human rights and the environment emphasise that non-regression, not going backwards, in environmental protection is indeed an existing legal duty under international environmental law and that there is a need to ensure progression in a common and cooperative manner. We suggest that any message otherwise is deeply damaging to countries' strategic interests and their own national security. After all, the rules-based system is there to maintain stability. But there are many interesting questions confronting us regarding how existing legal norms apply to these new facts, circumstances and updated scientific understandings. But of course, there's no shortage of MIAs in the environmental field. Indeed, the number of specific treaties on topics from oceans to climate have proliferated since 1972, and the first conference on the human and first conference on the human environment. Yet the environmental challenges are worsening, and this has now also led to the emergence of some pioneering research, which is based on ideas of network theory and assessing just precisely how existing treaty bodies do relate to each other. How we tackle so-called environmental problem shifting is now a highly topical issue, which is a subject of academic research in law and across um, taking a cross transdisciplinary approach. And I have included there a slide which I feel um, illustrates this interconnectedness well when we think about the environment. In the past, environmental laws have often focused on a particular issue, the end of a pipe or an industrial stack but not always the overall health of our ecosystems. And these two maps that you can see there, one is mapping the river network within the United Kingdom, and the other on the right is mapping river networks in Africa. So the next generation of environmental law, environmental law 2.0, if you like, must reflect this approach. In uh, the EU region, we have seen progressions towards that um, through, for example, uh, river basin management planning and catchment planning um, in terms of managing water resources across borders. And of course, rivers have been an area where progress has been possible, and it's now time to look to extend that progress. At a global level, we obviously have three very significant milestones on the horizon which will shape the future um, in the uh, coming months. The first you'll be aware is COP26 of the Climate Treaty, which is going to be held quite close to home for me in Glasgow in November. And then COP15 of the Biodiversity Convention, which will now take place as a hybrid event because of COVID in October this year and then um, with in-person aspects early next year. And thereafter, we anticipate that the Stockholm Declaration in 2022, which will be held 50 years since the first 1972 conference, and Living Law is a very proud partner of the initiative, which you may have heard of, called Pathway to the 2022 Declaration, which builds on some of the earlier work um, around the idea of a global pact for the environment. So we hope to see some refinement of legal principles, and I would certainly recommend having a look at the um, initiative's website and reading some of the blogs by leading academics and lawyers. So turning back to the human rights to a healthy environment, I'd just like to mention here the Human Rights Council at its 48th session is being asked to universally recognise for the first time the human right to a healthy environment. This is based on some serious academic work of the former and current UN Special Rapporteurs on Human Rights and the Environment, Professor John Knox and Professor David Boyd. And I would again much encourage you to follow this debate connect with your own diplomats and follow the hashtag time is now on Twitter. It's a huge milestone to see this progressing forward in this way, again, recognising um, uh, existing law, but in a universal recognition. And indeed, um, very promising to see as well that some countries that were previously reticent to this recognition, such as, for example, Germany, are now taking on a championing role. 
So I just want to say something here about environmental litigation and how we can be strategic with the law. For sure, it's a growing trend and where used responsibly, it can help to set very important precedents and remedy injustices. Um, but it does come with the caveat of the need to use these um, and exercise these uh, powers responsibly and also thinking quite strategically about ways that we can build and take the law forward. And um, governments obviously do as well have limited resources and uh, in litigation cases can also risk and divert the limited resources that they do have to dealing with those uh, rather than working on legislative progression. Um, and there are also key legitimacy issues that are coming up in terms of who brings environmental cases, what interests do they actually represent, and these cut across fairness and equity dimensions. Um, for sure, the law can't solve the ecological crisis on its own, but I think it's more naive to think that we can address these issues without the environmental rule of law. So one area of which I'm particularly um, encouraged by um, is some of the cases that we're seeing um, around uh, greenwashing and trying to tackle breaches of advertising regulations. Um, a problem today that is almost um, everything is stated by some corporations to be cre uh, clean and green. And is an area where we've tried to bring um, using existing law in this new way to promote a renewed culture of accountability and halt misleading of consumers um, with impunity. So these are not going to be a silver bullet. Corporations will generally have a budget line for traditional environmental law disputes, and they will create a steady stream of advisory work um, within the corporate world. But also reputations matter a great deal when it comes to business and consumers today, and particularly the younger generation, are demanding these actions. And I think that it may well lead to some very important progressions. And I've included just a slide there mentioning one of these very recent cases, which is a 17 year old student um, from Australia who is challenging HSBC, one of the world's largest banks, about its funding of coal. So that brings me to kind of looking ahead um, and some issues to do with the rights of nature, which is a particular area where we again would be interested to learn from colleagues here today. But essentially across Europe, this topic is now gaining much traction um, given the reality that no existing rights to water, food, et cetera, can function without uh, the rights of nature. So in 2018, Living Law prepared and launched a report with a substantial amount of work by a very talented intern that we had working with us at that time, Erica Solomeo. And we examined um, the position in several jurisdictions, including Ecuador, Bolivia, Colombia, New Zealand and India, as to the different forms that the rights of nature recognitions had taken in these different jurisdictions to date. There have since been several cases evolving particularly through the work of the Earth Law Centre and the Community Environmental Legal Defence Fund in the United States. And in 2019, um, we, uh, a constitutional amendment was effectively laid by a member of the Green Party before the Swedish parliament called the Riksdag. Um, and I've included um, there the translation of the proposed legal amendment that was put forward. And we now have here a formal consul uh, consultation, which has been opened by a member of the European Parliament Green Party, also exploring this on an EU wide level. So the rights of nature debate is firmly here. We see this as a critical issue towards moving towards securing harmony with nature. And we've also published recently a frequently asked questions briefing on the rights of nature, which aims to provide a um, common myths, dispel common myths and misconceptions, and hopefully looking forward to receiving feedback on that from colleagues in coming months. Um, but it's very much this coalition and emerging movement for legal change. In our report, we also tried to look at some interesting questions about who should speak for nature and within what institutional framework what ethical safeguards are needed. And this is a topic of much uh, research Yes, there are questions for sure to be considered, but we suggest here that there also are answers drawing on developments in, for example, the field of the rights of the child and from mental health, etc., where courts uh, can appoint a figure called here the curator ad litem to represent uh, the interest of a claim claimant who cannot speak for itself. 
And it's interesting to note that they obviously have a specific ethical responsibility and duty for which they are held to account in how those powers are exercised. And I have seen recently some very important and interesting academic thinking which is emerging around how the rights of nature may relate to the rights of future generations. So certainly one to, to watch. So coming towards my final few slides of my talk today, I want to underline that I think overall there's a lot of work to be done. We know what we need to do. We have all the tools and law to help make the shift towards societies within planetary boundaries. Stockholm plus 50 is an important moment and we hope to see the formal recognition there of a principle on the integrity and unity of the Earth system. You may also hear something about the pioneering work of the late Polly Higgins around the concept of a crime of ecocide. And following the appointment of a specialist legal drafting panel, there has now been a formal definition of ecocide which has been put forward. Then Brazil, you're fortunate, I think, to have the benefit of the wisdom of Justice Antonio Benjamin, a key figure within the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law and original chair of the committee. These issues are going to continue to come before our courts and we're looking to the legal world and judges to help us address them upstream before they do reach the, the door of the court. But indeed fraternity implies it is the duty of judges to protect nature on which all of life depends. And in my work today, I can share two reflections. Very often, the defence of nature relies on the bravery and resilience of a few very committed individuals to stand up and speak for nature. And as the Lorax says in Dr Zeus, I speak for the trees. Someone must speak up for nature. In the UK Supreme Court, one of our um, seminal judgments refers to the fact that the quality of the natural environment is of legitimate concern to everyone. There they consider the perspective of an osprey, which has no means of taking that step on its own behalf any more than any other wild creature. If its interests are to be protected, someone has to be allowed to speak up on its behalf. So until nature has standing through the recognition of the rights of nature, we have the right to stand up for it. It's interesting that um, quite often we are now hearing a kind of pushback against some of the issues to do with environmental rights in favour of only technocratic environmental law. And I would just emphasise here that the way that we have analysed these issues is that um, the rights of nature are not a substitute for um, detailed environmental regulation, rather that they are an optic through which we can reinterpret some of the existing environmental laws. Um, but I think there are quite important ethical reasons which are becoming very evident um, and do kind of justify this move forward in the UK um, and the EU. So I've mentioned a little bit already about the Aarhus Convention. I would just re-emphasise again then the importance for an environmental lawyer of environmental democracy um, upholding rights of access to information, promoting transparency. It can be very difficult at, at times, but it is a game changer. And I've been involved in cases where campaigners have been ignored for many years. A well-worded legal letter can certainly change that. And once the information out there is out, it's out there. But we need to do more to protect environmental defenders everywhere. There are many points that we might discuss further, but I think I'll stop there for, for now and um, come on to the discussion. Um, but obviously, uh, you know, we're seeing a huge movement with young people and youth taking really inspiring action across the world. And I think that the role of the law is to ensure that these uh, issues don't just fall on their shoulders, that it's up to all of us to collectively rise to this challenge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan, for your presentation. Uh, it was brilliant. Uh, it's so true and so important. Uh, uh, it's the subject of the moment, in my opinion. I, complet I completely agree with you. And we are now working on it in my classes, me and my students. Thank you so much for your presentation again. Uh, now let's talk to Professor Zagori Trajano to see if uh, he has some questions or considerations for Dr. Susan. 
Welcome again, Professor Sagori. I can hear you. Okay, sorry, sorry. Now, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Susan, for your presentation. Thank you, Professor Mariana, uh, for the invitation, the UNIMAR uh, post-graduation program. Uh, I'm happy to be here, but uh, when I try to talk about the harmony with nature, uh, I talk about one field that I love so much. And when you, know, when you talk, you talk about the living law, I thought about Milton Santos here in Salvador. Here, uh, the professor Milton Santos, uh, uh, several years ago, he said that you think global and act local, as you said. The relationship between humanity and nature uh, is one of the huge problems that you need to go through. And Professor Susan, I have some questions to ask you. And, and one of these is about the ecological crisis. The first one is about, uh, you spoke in your presentation, but I need to go deeply about uh, how should the rights of nature be placed in our courts? How can I, how can I talk about the Brazilian judge, the Brazilian justice, about uh, 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 the right of a river, uh, the, the right about the Amazon forest. How can I can uh, discuss as a lawyer uh, in our court about the nature, the right of, of nature? Is one of my uh, one of my questions. The second one is about you said in your presentation about make peace with nature. Uh, in Brazil, uh, we are. Uh, probably the, the most dangerous place to talk about the environment. Uh, the most the environment activists here in Brazil uh, was uh, th they were killed in our territory. So how can I how can I can talk about this? How can I can protect our activists? And in the same time, how can, you, how can I protect the environment here in Brazil? This is the second question. And the third one is, is about, you, you said in your presentation, how, how can the harmony with nature uh, can represent, can speak for nature? So how can uh, uh, not just the community, but the university, the programs as the UNIMA, how can uh, 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 the living people, how can a people, uh, uh, how can I say this in English, uh, everyone people uh, can protect the nature, can change this way to think nature some, uh, as a, 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 so, a something so far for us. How can I protect this nature as a living being that they need them and they need us. So this is one of the questions that I make. Thank you so much for being with us. Actually, when you talk about Ecuador, Bolivia, Colombia, India, I think you can, you can say that the debate about the rights of nature is one of the debates, the, the most important debates for as a, a Latin American people. So thank you so much, Professor Mariana. Thank you so much, Professor Susan. And I will be here to listen and hear your answers. Thank you, Professor Sagori. Dr. Susan, would you like to, to, to talk about this question? Well, thank you very much for these very thoughtful questions and I think they're very thought provoking. We could speak for many hours just on these subjects that you've raised today. I mean, I think ultimately there's not necessarily very easy answers to some of these issues and they do require us to keep working together. Um, but I think that one of the things that's most inspirational is this um, emerging global network of uh, common allies who are all collectively around the world uh, working within sometimes very different legal systems, but dealing with very similar issues and very similar 
um, issues in terms of the power of corporate lobbying and the dangers to human rights defenders, which you very um, you know, correctly raised. Um, I think that some of the answers in these issues uh, in the legal framework come from our governance mechanisms. I think we can't talk about rights of nature in a vacuum. We really need to look at ways that we can institutionalize the rights of nature within the infrastructure of our states. So there have been examples of, for example, um, future generation commissioners who've been established that where, for example, very controversial road schemes are being proposed and being built, that they have a requirement to be consulted and that this can be one area where we can look to try and bring in this uh, voice which has been you know, given this uh, responsibility to act and speak on behalf of future generations as part of the governance decisions. I think um, ultimately a lot is being left to civil society at the moment, and I don't think that that's necessarily fair or sustainable. We can't expect youth to do everything when we're dealing with very big gold mining projects, for example, in Latin America or in Turkey, etc. then the, the risks to people on the front line are very, very profound. And I don't think that they can be um, dismissed um, or downplayed. But I think that law has a very powerful role here and the, a role um, for potentially professional lawyers to come in from other jurisdictions and help to support those cases, whether they be in Scotland or they be in uh, Latin America, is definitely one way. Um, but I'm certainly learning on these issues as I've gone through my own career um, and perhaps was uh, slightly naive when I started out environmental law about just exactly how challenging some of these issues actually are on the front line. And even here, um, we face these issues when we're looking for access to information, sometimes on very high profile and, and challenging projects. So that perhaps answers one of your questions. Um, can you remind me of the other, other one? Yes, thank you so much. Just one is about how can I can, uh, how can you can push our justice our judge to think about rights right of nature and how can you place this in our courts? Mm -hmm. Again, I think these are very uh, difficult issues. I think that we have to appreciate that for many judges, sometimes the judges who are hearing cases haven't um, specialized necessarily in environmental law, depending at the level of which those cases are, are coming before courts. Um, and certainly I know that the the UN has set up this uh, global network for the, the judiciary as well, similarly to the IUCN. And I think that that is a really important um, network to enable our judges to actually have uh, conversations about um, uh, issues that they're confronting in their jurisdiction and to participate in global training events, etc. And I think that obviously um, there are certain countries which have environmental courts, for example, which is a, a way um, that, the, that the court system is looking to actually ensure it has the specialization to be able to deal with the cases that are coming before it. So there are lots of different options there. Um, Obviously, there has to be a willingness for judges to be interested in environmental law. And I think some jurisdictions, that's um, easier than others. And um, for some uh, countries, we're still kind of confronting this, um, that it's not their responsibility. And there are quite difficult issues as well between separation of powers sometimes, where cases are moving back and forward. Um, in some senses, there are many uh, government administrations which would be quite happy for judges to take the very difficult decisions and you know force people out of their cars etc and um, so that they don't have to make those very difficult decisions so I think that here some um, thinking is also needed about the remedies which can be sought in uh, court decisions uh, in the context of the environment and we have seen some quite new and progressive um, attempts, for example, to set up commissions uh, under the instruction of a judge that's required to report on particular issues like air pollution and water pollution within a particular period of time. Um, remedies uh, about uh, injunctions and, um, you know, these sorts of things. So it's certainly been in the UK around the clean air case, very, very topical issue. And I think we're seeing that in different jurisdictions because sometimes we have to 
recognise that by the time some of these issues are coming to courts at the moment, because of the pervasive failures in regulation over many, many years, there are very difficult issues confronting our courts by the time that these issues do get there. Professor Mariana, can I ask you, Thank you one so more? Thank you so much. Of course. Oh, oh, Professor Susan, I'm a coordinator here at university in the Northeast of Brazil. And some of my students ask me, Tagore, how can I, how can I uh, push, can, how can I improve this debate in our territory? Act local, as you said. And here uh, you have a, a, a review, a journal that talks about the uh, right of nature. How can I say, when I come back for uh, my class with my students, how can I say to them that oh, uh, uh, Professor Susan said to us that you can improve this debate here, the Northeast of Brazil, and this, this debate starts with you, it starts with uh, uh, each student that they have, more than a, 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 today is more than 50 students in the LLM degree. So how can I, uh, what do you can say for my students here in Brazil about like uh, the improvement of the rights of nature in Brazil? Well, thank you very much for that question as well. And I think it's very important that um, the environment is something that is local to us, but is also something that's global. And we can all do, uh, make changes in our everyday lives, which can make significant improvements to the environment. For example, not using a plastic bag, not having a disposable coffee cup. There are very, very small steps that are important. We also need to push um, big corporate actors to make changes. And I think that there is unfortunately some quite sophisticated lobbying just now, which is almost trying to turn the responsibility back to um, individuals uh, and, and saying that we don't need to make these system changes. Of course, the big responsibilities uh, for system change do need to rest with corporations, but we can all look at things like planting a tree instead of buying the, uh, I don't know, uh, gift from China to buy something that's locally made and locally grown. And I also think that communities are really important that we need to take a kind of partnership approach between local and national action on environmental law. Sometimes um, there have been mistakes in the past where actions have been taken on a very top down basis and um, without properly engaging local communities Equally, issues can sometimes get stuck at a local level or they can be kind of hijacked by particular groups. So it's not an easy um, either or. But I think that this idea about partnership is certainly a, a really very important one. Um, and also that sometimes it's not just the big issues that make a kind of major change. For example, I, I um, remember when I was in school, uh, I installed the first recycling system in, in our uh, junior school. And at that time, it was seen as something that was very uh, new and controversial, but something that's at one point controversial quickly becomes mainstream. Everybody gets used to it, that you put your aluminium cans in the recycling instead of somewhere else. So I think that sometimes looking for uh, small initiatives in a local area, like um, maybe putting in solar, something like that, or also doing um, for your, your students in particular um, pro bono activity to with people who may have never engaged with a lawyer. It's not something that's really seen as being uh, something that's available to them and actually providing legal advice into communities can be really, really important and change, change the game. Also going and speaking to schools on your work um, and the, you know, the studies that you've been doing. I think sometimes we need to work more on just how important the power of the law is for people to actually understand that they have these rights. Not everybody knows about the Aarhus Convention here or the Escazú Agreement in Brazil. And I think it's really um, an opportunity for lawyers to go and talk to other people in their community and to schools, etc., to make a broader awareness of these rights because rights are most well upheld when people know about them and there is a kind of culture of uh, knowing about rights. It's one of the unfortunate things that's kind of happened in the UK is that human rights have in a way been allowed to be portrayed as an imperialistic um, 
a thing that's only available to certain part of the population, which is of course completely wrong, but we need to make sure that legal advice and legal rights are there for everybody in order to build this real uh, culture of accountability and embed the environmental rule of law. It's great, great. And do you believe that Brazilian government uh, is on the right path toward these goals? And I think there's no government that's on the right path towards <laughs> And certainly my own government is not at the moment on the path that we would want to see them in. And we're making some progress in the run up to COP26. There have been some important announcements, but obviously we're all concerned about what happens to the Amazon. It's the lungs of the world and we all have a very clear shared interest. And I think hopefully um, we can try to help with some of the messaging that goes around the legal responsibilities that exist to protect the Amazon and to protect the rights of indigenous populations who are particularly affected by logging activity, etc. And perhaps I, mean, I can maybe turn the question around and say, do you think that, that governments here are on the right track? Okay. Thank you, Professor Tagori, for your participation. Brilliant as always. And thank you for your answers, uh, Dr. Susan. I have some questions on, on the topic. Uh, in fact, I shouldn't make questions because I'm just uh, moderating this event, but I can't resist uh, because there they are questions that I have studied a lot. This subject is so important to me. So uh, I, I would like to, to make these questions for you. Maybe you can help me to, to realize the answers. I think it's not so easy now for me. And in first place, uh, what do you think about the possibility of having a universal declaration on rights of nature? Do, do you believe that this can become reality, become true due to political difficulties? Uh, and a, a second point, I see my, my colleagues working in countries of common law, and sometimes uh, I imagine, I think that the, the work is easier for them because things are more dynamic and can change more easily. Uh, in Brazil, we have a strong constitution, and in this constitution, uh, the, the nature, it's only an uh, object of law. So things, I think the uh, change is more difficult. How, how to conciliate in our movement the difference, the difference between civil law countries and common law countries to protect uh, the rights of nature? Uh, this is a question. And sometimes uh, we talk for so, so long time to, to understand this difference. Uh, I, I have to talk a lot to explain this difference. Uh, it's not so easy for us in, in Brazil because if you have a action, a judicial action, and, and a judge uh, ha have a, a, a good decision for us, for our movement, mm -hmm. this only is, it's only for the, the, uh, the actors in this action not for all the society, mm -hmm. uh, it's not strong enough. Do you mean what, what I say? Mm -hmm. uh, another point, point uh, uh, sometimes I think uh, we, we are not able to abandon the anthropocentric view. Sometimes I think uh, it's because the society of consumption and all the vanity sometimes uh, I mean, a lack of, of hope. I don't know if it's because of the Brazilian situation, uh, but please uh, let me a uh, word uh, to hope. Mm -hmm. And another point, uh, do you think it's possible to talk about rights of nature and without talking about a uh, real change in economics, I'm thinking because uh, I have studied uh, the theory of the growth 
I don't know if you know the work of mm -hmm. Professor Serge Latouche. And sometimes I think uh, the idea of sustainable development is, is a kind of greenwashing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just uh, keeping the things where they are. And maybe we have to change the speed to something more radical. I don't think it's uh, uh, so radical at all, but uh, something that shows uh, us uh, like something necessary, uh, including this new times of the pandemic. What do you think about it? I think it's not so easy to answer, but it, it's, it, there, there is the point that I'm studying right now. Now, these are very important questions, I think, and I would love to be able to debate these with you in more detail. I, mean, I think on the first point, obviously, we need to try to move beyond the anthropocentric perspective towards an eco-centric perspective, but it's not going to happen overnight, and it, it is very difficult. Um, for all countries, I think, in the world, uh, there's not really any country that's quite there yet, with maybe a few exceptions. But I think that perhaps once we have the formal recognition of the human right to a healthy environment, that, that will then create space for also um, more messaging about the rights of nature and particularly following the COVID-19 pandemic. It feels like after 10 years of speaking about these issues that something is finally shifting, that people are becoming more aware of the, the interlinkages with nature that we've lost. On your point about um, universal declaration, obviously it is ultimately what many people want to see, um, but I think we're not there yet and there is quite a way to go to get there. Um, once the human right has been more formally recognised, I think there will be greater space for advocacy. And we saw quite an interesting case in Scotland around um, fracking uh, proposal, where our government wanted to bring in a moratorium, a ban on fracking. And uh, the fracking company looked to try to challenge that decision on the basis that its human rights were going to be violated. So I think those kinds of cases, obviously there was a lot of um, messaging around rights of nature, et cetera. The case itself would have been fundamentally flawed, that it was very unlikely to be upheld um, in court, but it just shows the way in which some of these issues do kind of play out when there are very significant economic interests involved. So I'm not sure exactly um, in Brazil how the human rights um, landscape lies, but there's been quite a lot of helpful jurisprudence from the European Court of Human Rights around the ability to regulate property. And I think sometimes we can see property, um, it is an issue, it's a barrier sometimes to the uh, systemic changes that, we're, that we need to see, but sometimes property rights can also be used to make very uh, major environmental improvements and enhancements. For example, I, I read about a couple who planted uh, replanted an area of rainforest on their land and we have examples of um, the sort of uh, rewilding initiatives as it's been called kind of looking to turn uh, uh, land back to its original uh, condition and to rewild the land in Scotland which is being principally led actually by private sector actors and landowners who are then, you know, looking to capitalise on, for example, tourism opportunities, etc. But from the perspective of the, the law and the legal setting, it's become very, very clear that um, there is a, a right for governments to be able to regulate property interests in, you know, the wider social interest. Um, I'm just trying to come back to some of the other points that you that you mentioned. Um, I mean, ultimately, on the economic paradigm issue, I do think that there's a lot to 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 be done. And uh, I don't know if you've followed the work of Kate Raworth on um, donut economics. There's a very useful book that looks at this: how we need to try to uh, make social issues also fit within the safe operating space, so rights for people to water, food, etc. And it does require a kind of fundamental shift in our economy. But there are some inspiring um, examples of, for example, circular economy and the work that's been done around, you know, reusing, uh, recycling, etc., which start to 
kind of provide hooks and threads of that in future and how it may develop. Um, see, and in terms of the difference between civil and common law countries, there are very significant differences that we do need to be aware of. But I think in the European context, um, maybe it's not as uh, significant here because there is a harmonization with EU law, but certainly I've worked in countries in Central and Eastern Europe, um, like Bulgaria, for example, and um, uh, which operates under a civil system. And um, certainly a lot of the issues, albeit that the common civil divide is, uh, is there, that the actual practical issues that are being faced are quite similar. So I'm not sure if that answers some of your questions and feel free to uh, raise if there were points that you wanted to talk about in more detail just now. I definitely think we can continue this conversation um, after. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Susan. Sometimes I think that uh, it's impossible to have the right answers, but I think that it's important to make the same question. And, is the point of the question uh, uh, putting us together? Some um, that think the same way. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's important now to be with the, the professors and activists that, that think the same way to get stronger in the movement. Thank you so much. I think uh, our event is at, at the ending right now, we have to end because of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to thank you again for your lecture. And um, as I told you before, you are brilliant and, and a sensitive person. Uh, what is more important, thank you for, for being uh, this person uh, who you are. And your presence here today is so important, uh, not only uh, by the subject, and your knowledge, but to enlighten my, my students, young people, to, to continue fighting for, for the nature. Thank you so much. I think we can use the university in this fight. This is my plan. And more than that, I think it's our duty as professors. And I, I think Professor Tagori agrees with me. I think as professors, we can we should, uh, uh, we have to do this work. And thank you so much. And I would like to, to talk a little in Portuguese to my students now. Uh, agora falo um pouco em português, agradecendo aos nossos alunos que acompanharam esse evento hoje. Nós sabemos que um evento feito completamente em inglês é mais difícil para vocês, uh, que vocês têm que se esforçar um pouco mais. Mas a presença de vocês é, demonstra né, o interesse, essa vontade, é, essa paixão pelo conhecimento, pelos estudos. E eu acho que esse é o combustível que nós estamos precisando agora, é, que pode nos fortalecer né, nessa nossa pesquisa em relação aos direitos da natureza. Muito obrigada pela presença de vocês. E a gente se encontra na próxima, uh, na próxima quarta-feira, com mais um evento do Diálogo sobre Desenvolvimento em Empresa e Sociedade. Thank you again, Dr. Susan. I hope uh, to see you again. Thank uh, you so much for the opportunity. Possible. And thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. And I, I look forward to continuing the conversation in future. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Professor Tagori. Thank you so much, guys. See you, see you later. Thank, thank you, Professor Susan. Thank you, thank you Professor Mariana. Thank you, Anna.